Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us here um, in this virtual general body meeting. Um, my name is Meredith. I am co-president of GAU. And um, we're here to bring you today some updates on, on what your union has been working on this semester, as well as our plans for the future. Uh, we'll get into some detailed reports from each of our committees in just a moment. But first, I want to give you some general updates about uh, what we've done from the semester. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you all for your support, for being here today, for your continued support, even just a quick like thank you for all you're doing through a text or whatever. That's It does not go unnoticed. And all of that appreciation is truly what keeps us, or at least keeps me going when the dumpster fire of 2020 feels like it's completely hopeless. So I appreciate it so much and, and we really value your, your support. Um, that said, uh, we have been recently recognized for a growing mem membership. So um, this is excellent news, keep this up, uh, get your friends to join, uh, speak about our union during those times before and after classes, even if it's in a virtual space. This stuff really helps and we really need this, this our, our growing membership to do some of the things that we're thinking of in the future. Um, one of the big things that we started off this semester was our anti-austerity campaign. And this largely is this, this big idea that UF is conducting itself like a large corporation rather than um, a public institution of higher education. And so we, we compiled a list of demands of UF to help like regulate <laughs> this uh, to, for them to meet us um, on this. And I mean, this includes addressing um, anti-racism on campus, addressing uh, the continued abysmal uh, affordable housing on, on campus that UF is trying to demolish. Um, we're trying to, to try and hold UF accountable uh, and, and transparent for how they're dealing with COVID-19 and um, how they, the things that we need to keep us safe. Um, there's looking at, oh, uh, one of the, the big, big things about this was um, the idea about diverting funds from the uh, endowment into, um, to, to help pay for uh, uh, UF's bills essentially, so they don't have to furlough us or furlough others, um, uh, staff and, and teams workers. Uh, and we really started this off early in the semester with uh, picketings at football games. Uh, we had a lot of um, involvement from our members and um, various coalitions that, are, that have come together around this issue. And, um, it, it worked <laughs> for, for at least for furloughs anyway. Um, in the beginning of the semester, early on in bargaining, uh, the UF administration had mentioned that we would be, that, that, uh, had mentioned furloughs um, or impending furloughs. And we got out there, we, we spoke at um, uh, board of trustees meetings, we picketed and really like later on, UF claimed that the graduate assistants were exempt from furloughs. And we are the only um, unit that is exempt from furloughs it, it, as a, um, a hired unit at U, UF. So this is, this is a, a big win for us, it's huge. Um, that being said, <laughs> there's a lot we have to do and I'm sure that, I, that you're well aware of it as well. Um, I do wanna give a quick update on our fellows program. So uh, we have uh, several fellows working for us. So the, they're organizing fellows that are funded by um, the United Faculty of Florida. And what we do is normally we go to um, your office, uh, try to have conversations with you, try to, to get members like you out to, to um, events like this. Uh, that has largely changed over the semester since we are working completely virtual. So our fellows have been communicating via email. Uh, you may have noticed phone calls coming out um, in the summer and even in, in, the, in the fall. Um, we're doing a lot of communication via text. I'm, I'm sure you, you've seen plenty of texts from us. And um, we also have tried to implement some way to get in touch with everybody by uh, meeting in person at like Depot Park in open spaces where we feel it's safe to, to have um, some socially distanced conversations. And so um, the fellows are gonna be continuing to work into next semester. And uh, so keep an eye out for us. If you would like to have uh, somebody come into your department and speak more on GAU 
and um, all of the awesome things we're doing throughout the semester, get in co contact with us. Um, each one of us is more than happy to come in and, and speak to your department and, and uh, try to get some current members more active and get more members as well. Um, so I think that's largely what I have to speak on. If there's no other um, input from my fellow officers, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to, uh, let me get my agenda pulled up. Um, we're, we'll go with the healthcare report first from Rachel. Go ahead and, and introduce yourself, Rachel, too. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Hartnett. I'm the uh, healthcare chair. Um, I'm fairly new in the position. I started like right before COVID started. So this has been a very strange uh, time for me as well. Uh, um, so um, a lot of my updates um, are going to come through um, Javier as well, because a lot of what I've been doing has been on the bargaining front. Um, however, when it comes to healthcare, we have a lot of things in the works. <laughs> um, our biggest concern, obviously, is the fight against face-to-face um, -face. Um, for spring. It's a terribly, terribly, terribly ill-conceived idea. Um, it's dangerous. And a, a large portion of that currently has been uh, fighting to make sure those who applied for ADA accommodations um, and were denied, uh, we are currently in the process of filing grievances and legal disputes against them. Um, uh, these will be uh, discrimination lawsuits against the university for un unsafe working conditions. Um, I'm currently in the process of doing one myself um, and I actually spoke with the lawyer today. So if you were denied an ADA accommodation and you fall anywhere on the CDC's list, please don't hesitate to contact me about that. Because again, the more people we have, the more we can bog down UF, the more people we can protect. So that's super important. Um, Um, yeah, and I think I think that's the biggest update that I have. Everything else, I will probably uh, jump in when Javier covers healthcare bargaining uh, later in the presentation. So it's great seeing you all for this. I look forward to working with you all. Yeah, sorry, I just want to jump in here really quick. I also want to thank anyone here who has already um, come to us with an ADA denial and allowed us the opportunity to um, help rectify that. Um, Rachel has reached out to you, but also just know that, you know, it does take courage to come to us and to speak out when you're treated unfairly. Um, and you, when you do so, you're, you're leading um, your fellow workers. So thank you for, for having the courage to, to speak out and to seek assistance. Um, and please encourage your friends to do so as well. Yeah. And again, our goal is to prevent face-to-face -face return entirely. Um, but uh, again, making sure that we're protecting those most vulnerable amongst us, uh, either you know, with their physical health, their mental health, or uh, financially, right? Which also bleeds into our anti-austerity campaign. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have mental health, uh, the mental health care report from Kimberly. Hi, hi everybody. Um, my name is Kimberly Williams. I'm a uh, second year PhD student in the English department. I'm originally from Virginia. So now I'm in Florida and I absolutely hate it, but we're all here together. And I'm so happy that um, you all are here and spending your time with us too as well. Um, I hope that you are safe and healthy. Um, yeah. Um, so for this year, um, because of various complaints um, concerning talk space, we have tried to renegotiate a different contract for a different provider, um, more specifically a company called Lyra. Um, they are more selective with their clinicians in terms of their quality of care, their intake, um, their hiring practices, um, their issues with inclusion. With that, um, they are up to three to four times as much as, as Talkspace. And that is with a negotiation contract that they had with Dr. Sumfest. So um, furthermore, with that, we are still trying to nick and nick and nick because um, there could be a possibility to, to switch that, right? For, for like the next contract discussion and upheaval. 
Um, with that in mind, talking with Dr. Sumfest and also Talkspace executives, um, we have proposed, or at least we're, we're now finally in um, the, the final stages of for starting in January, there for one will be an expanded care um, for therapists overall. So Talkspace is free with grad gator care. Um, however, if the clinician just isn't working right, you really wanna go um, somewhere outside of those parameters, but someone in Florida, you'll be able to go ahead and see that clinician for with, with a copay. Um, psychiatry in Gainesville is, um, is horrible. Um, there are, I think maybe two to three that are accepting new clients in Gainesville that accept our insurance. So um, Talkspace will now have psychiatry um, starting in of the next year too as well, and with new directions with um, a copay. So that's gonna expand overall that particular care. Um, if there are still um, comments or concerns, if you feel comfortable, because I know it is obviously um, you know, like difficult to talk about if you are having issues with the quality of care, um, please, you can feel free to, to send like a general UF email. You can contact me um, personally, um, but we're hoping that the quality of care will, will increase, particularly because Talkspace has, of course, been so inundated. Um, they're looking at ways to better support their clinicians so we can get better care. Um, additionally, um, looking at other efforts that, and I'm not sure if we're going to be talking about like the UF Black effort um, at all, but I'll just say that if we talk about that maybe like later. So, uh, yeah. actually, Kimberly, I actually I, I forgot to put that on the agenda. So if you want to talk about it, please feel free to. Yeah, that was my bad. Sorry about that. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, that, that's totally fine. Um, there's going to be a meeting soon um, concerning about um, the, the UF Black effort and its discussion of having a town hall for the spring semester. Um, there was originally a meeting that was supposed to happen this summer. Um, there was a little bit of some, supposedly some miscommunication where none of the administrators showed up for that particular meeting. So now there has been a planning of multitude of other meetings with alumni and faculty members about um, really looking at like a particular agenda and a list of demands to have for that particular meeting for the UF Black effort, which includes a multitude of student organizations um, who are Black identifying or Black identifying like mission and goals um, to really start holding the administration accountable or at least letting the media know what is happening here on the um, corporation grounds that is Florida. Thank you. Also. Yeah, and, and I will say that that's part of our anti-austerity campaign as well, because what you see from the university administration is they love to pay lip service to diversity. They don't want to talk about issues of racism now, right? So diversity, good to talk about. Racism, bad to talk about. And they refuse to invest any financial or human resources into addressing the hostile environment on campus for students, for faculty, for staff, um, and to really rectifying some of the ingrained um, racial inequities in the UF system. Um, it's very much, you know, blue key, I think is the best example of, uh, <laughs> of that. But so yeah, we're, we're in touch um, with the um, Black Graduate Student Organization and um, a little bit with the Black Student Union as well. So we will keep everyone updated. Um, we, we're gonna return to this. Um, when we get to the discussion about organizing, because it is part of um, the last thing we want to talk about today. But is there anything else you wanted to say, Kimberly? Because uh, I think you said you might have to go early. Or... No, um, that's uh, that's all. I was just going to quickly scan through the participants to see if there's anybody also from UF. I want to show something um, a little bit later, but um, that's all. Um, I'll put my um, my I can put my email in the chat. Um, to you, that helps um, with any questions, comments, and concerns, and I wish you all well. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, so next we have the uh, grievance report. Um, Kaylee's not here this afternoon, so we, which is fine because we don't really have many grievances to report on, which is an excellent thing. Um, largely, uh, issues within departments have been sorted through like what we call marching on the boss events. And this is where we organize, uh, GAU helps organize members of a particular department 
that's um, having trouble with, an, with something happening in their department. And they come together collectively, uh, maybe write a letter, form a petition and hand it over to the department head in the department. Um, and this is, this is incredibly effective and a, a great use of our resources. Um, and it's something we always try to do before we, we push things further into grievances. So uh, that is our report on grievances. Next is the bargaining report from Javier. Hello, everyone. I, I apologize in advance. The sun is setting just outside my window um, and it's, it's making me squint and or move around in funny ways um, or look blue. Um, but it's been a very, uh, very uh, active year in bargaining, as most of you, I hope, know. We have bargained for our a full book this year, meaning that the entirety of the contract is up for negotiations. Um, I think that we're just about wrapped up. We started in January 15th um, and maybe ended about a week ago. Um, I'm going to share a link to a website put together by our coordinator, Stephen, um, so that you can kind of follow along here once I open my chat. So uh, before we start this conversation, it's important to note that we've kind of, uh, the, the cloud of COVID has really hung over the bargaining table um, and really defined what we talked about. Um, we really had a long list of things that we wanted to get done this year, um, but unfortunately, the um, you know we had to redirect our priorities to deal with COVID. We put a lot of efforts into a COVID memorandum of understanding, so I'll address that first. Um, and full book went along uh, pretty much the same time. Um, so with the COVID MOU, we secured a, a few things we're proud of. Um, the university, we I think we increased uh, avenues of communication with us in the university. Um, we're currently still working to um, update that with a cleaning provision that will require departments not to um, force GAs to clean, uh, perform the kind of deep cleanings that should be performed by trained staff who are equipped to do that, um, to re resolve any lingering uh, COVID particles that should not be our job. It's not in your job contract. Um, and they, they probably don't want you to do that either for liability reasons. Um, we are also, as part of that uh, memorandum of understanding, um, and I can post a link to that uh, specific memorandum. Uh, but as part of that, we're also looking to cement a provision that will continue to cover uh, COVID-related inpatient services uh, for, for Gator grad care until 2022. So all of next calendar year, um, we're looking forward to posting that language before we ratify uh, the contract uh, or we vote to ratify the contract. But that's kind of what's going on with the COVID MOU. Um, that's been done for a few months, so I didn't really want to focus on that. Um, but I will share the link to that. That's on our CBA page uh, under Memorandum of Understanding for COVID. And here's the link for that as well. So now I'll talk about what we focus on with the collective bargaining agreement, the general contract. Um, as I said, COVID has really, um, Kind of decided what we could talk about, um, and the university has taken a, a conservative financial position, not just in bargaining with us, but in bargaining with the faculty um, and in their day to day management decisions. So, the major thing I think that we discussed and kind of resolved is uh, healthcare. We are so far during this three year period about $750,000 in the red on healthcare. Um, and so, uh, the, the university came to us and is looking to sort of cover that deficit, um, whether COVID, independent of COVID, these were the expenses. So we um, we kind of worked together to, based on utilization numbers and trends, uh, sort of cut some benefits, but also we gained some benefits as well. Um, there's a lot going on with that, and I don't think that I can really do it justice in a quick amount of time that I'm allotted during this meeting, um, but that information is all pretty much available on the link I shared. Um, the big takeaways, I think, for you, um, are number one, uh, utilization is not really driving these rising costs. Um, that just kind of happens in healthcare uh, normally. Um, utilization numbers are actually very good for us. Where we uh, took some benefit cuts, um, we're on the extreme ends. Uh, usually these cuts manifested as an increase in the calendar year deductible, not by very much, um, or maximum out of pocket costs, um, which very few graduate assistants actually hit. Um, so we're comfortable making those sacrifices. Um, we are getting some stuff in exchange. Um, we continue negotiations about over whether we want to use talk space or not. Um, there's now repatriation coverage as well. So if, if something terrible happens and a GA dies, we can get them back to their home country without any additional costs. 
um, and minor things like that. Um, but what this means for you, essentially, the average GA, um, and many of you don't use healthcare, and that's you know that's that's fine. Um, these costs will only figure into your paycheck uh, at about one dollar per paycheck, um, which is pretty good for us to cover a three quarters of a million dollar deficit, and not just in the past, but moving forward. Right, we're trying to cover up a deficit for. Uh, what they project to be the next three years as well. Um, for every dollar you pay, which is again, one per paycheck, um, the university is paying about $3 um, to cover that deficit. So we're still continuing a very favorable uh, employee to employer payment ratio when it comes to the uh, monthly premium that we pay to get a grad care. Um, so that's that's mostly, uh, if you have questions about healthcare and it's very complicated. Um, well, and I, yeah, and I, I, I do wanna I do want to add here that we were able to save off we do want we were able to stave off thanks to the work of javi rachel and kimberly uh really keeping the pressure on bill paul duncan and the team at gator care we were able to stave off any serious increases in out-of-pocket costs through deductibles and through the out-of-pocket maximums um this is important because when you were able to keep those out-of-pocket costs down um you allow everyone to sh to, to share in the cost burden um, and you don't leave the most vulnerable people, people who might be in you know, a car accident or those with um, chronic conditions, you're not leaving them out in the cold and making them um, just pay outrageous out of pocket costs. So we were able to maintain the equitable structure of, of the program, um, which is, I think, the most important thing uh, because some of us know we're part of the most vulnerable because we might have chronic conditions, but the next day, you could be in a car accident. You don't know if you're going to be that person. Um, so everyone's protected when we're when we're able to ensure a, a collective payment system like we have. So I want to thank uh, Javi, Rachel, and Kimberly for all the work they've done there, and everyone who showed up to bargaining. Um, because if you guys don't show up, obviously they are just going to run roughshod over us. Um, we don't get our authority to really speak on behalf of you unless you show up. So everyone. Um, bearing through the Zoom fatigue and showing up to bargaining was was really, really important. Thank you. And I just want to clarify, thank you, Bobby. That, that, that's a good point. Uh, our, a lot of our strategy was not to, to obviously work around COVID and COVID demands, um, but also not to put uh, the burden uh, of increased costs onto our most vulnerable members. Um, so we took what were, that was an option we would distribute um, those costs among the entire membership. And again, uh, it's only uh, $1 per paycheck, which is $2 per month in increase in premium. Uh, still comparatively low um, as far as health insurance premiums go. If you've ever worked another job uh, where you paid into private health insurance, uh, $12 is kind of a steal. Um, I think even compared to other state university uh, graduate assistants, um, we are still um, paying a lot less. Um, so that's worth noting. I did say that the premium increase uh, was $2 per month. That's specific to uh, the majority of GAs who don't pay for dependents, right? Obviously, if you're paying dependent premiums, your, your rates are very different. Um, and what you can expect to pay has already kind of been worked out. Um, and that information is also available on that website under Article 12, Healthcare. Um, Rachel, did I, did I miss anything uh, major? Okay. No, no, I think you got it. The only thing I, I want to clarify about the uh, COVID coverage in the MOU, we have verbal confirmation that they are going to cover. We're just waiting on the final documentation of it. And again, that will cover any testing and inpatient hospitalization costs if you uh, due to COVID. And again, we're specifically making that extremely broad because of the host of, of conditions that come with COVID, um, cardiovascular as well as respiratory. Um, so again, we're just waiting on, on language for that, but that, that's a really huge win um, to make sure that we're protected. And again, you cur that's currently what we have already for this year. So if you are getting charged for anything related to COVID testing, please reach out to me so we can make sure that we can fight that because the insurance companies don't know how to code things and things get wrong and you get a bill, so don't pay. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, so uh, once we have that language, we'll make that available. Um, we've informed the administration that our ratifying of any contract is contingent upon reception of that kind of language. And I believe that they'll follow through because uh, people at Gator Grad Care, specifically Dr. Sumfest, who's at the tippy top, is involved in writing that language. So I don't think that they're going to flake on that. Um, but healthcare was a major issue. I think the second major issue. Uh, regards Article 20. So as you may recall, um, 
Last year, we had a couple of GA deaths, um, and we've been very concerned that um, there are basically holes in the communication between uh, GAU and the administration about uh, preventing something like this in the future, right? So um, what we've worked out together is, uh, is a clause that it's kind of hard to put into a lot of contracts. Uh, a lot of employers see this kind of stuff as wishy-washy, but if, effectively, um, if you become aware of any, anything that may disrupt the mental health of a graduate assistant um, in the workplace, um, the university has agreed to extend its disruptive conduct policy to apply to, to those instances. Um, and you can report this stuff uh, anonymously and it will trigger an investigation by human resources. So this is good because it will kind of, you don't have to work within the department with the, um, I guess the, the, the troublemakers. Um, you can jump, jump directly to HR and HR will investigate anything that might support an underlying uh, allegation of disruptive conduct. And uh, GAU will get a copy of that, of the investigative findings as will the complainant. So this will help, especially I think with trouble PIs, uh, this will help in two areas. I think with PIs who get into, who should be in a lot of trouble, who constantly badger and abuse GAs, um, we can start to build a pattern uh, of reports against them uh, to make cases against tenured professors who continue to abuse uh, their their employees, their, their coworkers. Um, and if you're an international student, your visa might be very closely tied to your work. Um, so again, it puts this stuff on, US radar so that they're kind of liable to some extent for not taking action. Uh, GAU is informed so that we can kind of take action as well as needed. Um, and you're not to suffer any retaliation for that. Um, and you have other means, this is not an exclusive means, you can report complaints uh, through other mechanisms available under the contract as well. So that's under Article 20, That's we're pretty proud of that. We're hoping that it can, uh, through this mechanism, we can avoid tragedies like what happened last year um, and again, that information is cool. under Article Twenty, Proposal Four, on that website. Uh, Bobby, yeah, and, you and I, I, I do want to, I do want to um, emphasize here too. This allows for anonymous reporting. Um, now, anonymity does have some drawbacks because if being if if being anonymous limits um, how much HR is able to to do to rectify the situation or how much information they're able to to gather. Um, that's an issue, but essentially now when you have um, emotional, psychological um, problems um, between your work supervisor, your PI, and yourself, you can either go to HR and report anonymously or come to GAU and we can help you fill out some paperwork to get the report going. Um, that gets your foot in the door. It gets this looked at without having to file a file a grievance and put your name on something publicly. Um, so we hope that this will allow people to feel safer speaking up um, and getting us involved. We now have a mechanism to to look at this stuff and shine a light on, on some of these practices. Thanks, Bobby. And I, I will add, so anonymity, this is a state institution, obviously. So uh, anonymity is uh, it's fine. So it's confidentiality is a different matter kind of altogether. Um, at some point, some of this information may be made public. Um, what was reported, at least, um, an anonymous complaint doesn't mean that you have to give your name, right? Um, but confidentiality, to some extent, a state entity can never truly promise you confidentiality. Um, you know, your UF email is not confidential. <laughs> Anything you write on there is, can be made public. Um, kind of the same thing with HR investigations to some extent, right? Especially, but not really when uh, investigations are ongoing. Usually, that uh, state entities are don't have to make public certain details of investigations. Um, but thanks, Bobby, for chiming in. Uh, we hope, like, like we said, that this will make it easier for, for GAs and uh, troubling psychological situations to, to get some help. Um, and we'll kind of put all the important actors on notice um, so that we can take preemptive action as opposed to uh, action when it's a little too late. Moving forward, um, we had to kind of focus on less financial aspects of the contract as a result of COVID. Um, with Article 4, we add some language that will allow the uh, university or departments to um, offer uh, research assistantships to TAs uh, during the summer so they continue their work. Um, and 
I, I stress to continue their work. You're not supposed to be there to be supervising uh, undergraduates or performing some something that not related to your research. Um, so we hope that this will kind of add to, to employment prospects for, for nine month uh, GAs. So they continue their work and continue to uh, meet academic progress requirements moving forward. Article 22 pertains to grievances. Uh, what we did there was largely procedural, uh, shed some light uh, or put, put in some clarification for the grievance process, um, defining who in large departments is in charge of hearing the first step of grievances, um, which will probably not affect most of you, um, but I have a duty to tell you that nonetheless, the boring procedural stuff. <laughs> and um, Article 25 um, is kind of the article that shapes the contract and how we will negotiate moving forward. Essentially, we had plans for to discuss paid parental leave this year was going to be a big more key issue for us. Um, we kind of backed off after the after COVID hit to focus on the MOU and uh, kind of the giant healthcare colossus on the horizon. Um, but we have worked that into next year's uh, negotiation, specifically 2021 to 2022 ac uh, academic year. We're hoping that COVID costs kind of subside at that point. Um, the university will. Um, be in a better position, um, not just uh, at face value, but in the books to to make uh, payments for paid parental leave. I think that's really the only takeaway from uh, from Article Twenty Five. I will say that we will be negotiating. Um, there's fee relief has been a major issue um, this year. Um, we were quite concerned that the university was going to balk on that and not honor their promises. Um, it's my understanding that you should get paid your due fee relief during the next paycheck on December 18th. It's been uh, like pulling teeth to get them to move because there's a lot of different departments and programs in the university that oversee this. Um, I think that they, you know, they, they know that they have to pay it or else it's gonna cost them more money in the end. So they're going to do it. Um, our current, the current debate, well, the debate moving forward, Right, not for fall 2020, but for spring 2021 up till 2023 and the uh, next uh, full term contract is how they're going to pay it. The university insists that they cannot pay outright or they can't just uh, remove your fees from the bursar accounts. Um, they insist that that goes against Board of Gover uh, uh, Florida Board of Governors rules. I disagree. I think that they're not right about that. And we provided evidence to contradict their position nonetheless. Um, what we what we're currently working on right now is language for spring 2021 and, and forward. If the university is going to pay this out through your paycheck or in a lump sum, which we would prefer a lump sum as opposed to payment through each individual paycheck, they, it sounds like they're uh, they've agreed to uh, cover any tax liability. So the problem with paying this out as wages is wages are taxable, right? Um, and I'll end it on the most boring note possible. Very quick tax conversation, uh, but basically your wages are taxable. Uh, small, small percentage, depending on how much you make, that will depend on if you get 16,000 or 30,000 a year, the, the amount is different, how much you're taxed, right? The university has agreed in order to make us full that they need to pay at, to offset those tax withholdings. So you might make even a little bit more money than you were initially promised. Um, that's between you and Uncle Sam, right? Um, but that's kind of what we're working on for spring 2021. Uh, again, late, later 2021, we'll be addressing paid parental leave. Un university of Florida is behind compared to other top 10 universities on that measure. Um, and that's that will wrap up the full year of bargaining we've had or we exhausted, uh, but I cannot uh, echo this enough. Thank you so much for your support. I've seen many of you at these bargaining sessions um, and you're the real leverage we have. So if, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly. Um, I have a lot of information I wanna shed off my brain and dump it onto you. So uh, feel free to do that liberally, uh, but thank you. Um, if, if you wanna go on about taxes for another four or five minutes, Alyssa is gonna be joining us, I think at 4.45, she said in her email. So if we can talk about taxes or spending, you wanna appropriate some stuff? Sure, I've got a jug of bleach next to me, let's get started. <laughs> thank you, Javier. Um, and I just wanna note, I think at one of our last bargaining sessions, we had somebody speak out just in general, and it was incredibly effective. I think it was it was like it was a very sobering moment where uh, these university admin don't really have any idea of what we do or what our lives are like. It, they're so far removed from what we do, and so hearing from members and graduate assistants is is really I think powerful and forces them to see 
us as human beings, <laughs> I guess is a good, is a way to put it. Um, and not just like people that are bark or bugging them twice, once every other week. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind when you show up to these sessions, if you have something to say, um, I, we encourage to hear this, this kind of stuff from our members. Um, so Alyssa is, is running a little late, uh, which is fine. We can, we can kind of skip the, the chief steward report for now. Uh, next, we have international affairs report. I've seen Akil here. I don't know if Jackie's here. Akil, can you speak up for that, please? Anyone can unmute, right, Stephen? Correct. All right, I'm not hearing anything. Um, Bobby, do you have uh, uh, just a quick report to give on international the international affairs committee? Yeah. So as you know, the the, the number one issue uh, facing international graduate workers this semester is the confusion over whether or not um, graduate students and undergraduate students on the F one visas will be allowed to take classes fully remote next semester um, or if they must continue to take at least one class in person um, right now the federal guidance is unclear and the department of homeland security has um, proposed a new rule that would require um, at least one in-person class but that rule hasn't been approved yet um, it might not be approved there's a lot of moving parts in dc um, the International Center is taking a conservative position, um, assuming that if the rule does uh, become enacted, um, it would be better to already have people register for these courses rather than um, have to revoke their visas um, midway through the semester. That being said, the International Center, um, after speaking with us, is, rem is remaining flexible. Um, and it could be the case that if in the beginning of the semester, international students do have to take at least one in-person class, that class could theoretically go remote. So if it turns out that guidance changes and it becomes clear that you do not need to have an in-person class to um, maintain your F1 visa status, you would be able to take that class remote. So there is a door open just because you might have to start out the semester um, on campus doesn't mean that you have to stay uh, on campus for long. So, um, you know, we will continue to monitor that situation along the International Center. Um, I do have a contact at the University of Michigan um, whose administration is uh, interpreting these guidance, uh, these guidelines a little bit more liberally. Um, and that person is reaching out to me when they when I hear new stuff too. As of right now, they are also requiring an in-person component, but I imagine um, they would jettison that component before we would. If they do, I will get notified by my contact at UM, um, and then I'll take it to the international committee chairs and then see if we can um, light a fire under the rear of the international center to, to do something about it. That's the most concise way I can I can put it. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you. There's there's a lot of details there that I don't want to misspeak on. So, um, okay. Next is the treasurer report. Uh, Glenn, our treasurer, is not here this evening, but um, we can discuss the budget together. Uh, he has um, been nice enough to send it over to us, and this budget we will be voting on. So, um, Stephen, can, do you mind sharing the budget? Okay, so um, just as a review, um, or not a review, but a reminder, our budget comes from the dues our members pay, and about 90% of those dues go to um, our parent union, UFF, and those are used, uh, and they use that money to pay uh, dues towards the national unions that we are a part of, um, NEA and FT, and it also goes to overhead such as legal fees, trainings um, to pay for lobbyists to help us on our journey to fight fee relief um, in, uh, along with policymakers. Um, 
But 10% of those fees come back to us as our annual chapter rebate, and that's what we use to co compile our yearly budget. So breakdown here is as follows. Um, okay, so we have about uh, 23,000 or about $24,000 um, uh, in our checkings and savings accounts. And then with the anticipated um, expected uh, uh, chapter rebate with of $13,000, that leaves us with an operating budget of $36,000 in or $36,843 and five cents. Uh, the way we have broken down this budget has not changed from previous uh, the previous year, aside from one item, and um, we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, really, uh, the we go towards a, a lot of our our budget goes towards recruitment. Um, this is going towards paying for t-shirts, um, paying for things we might need during bargaining meetings. Um, socials when we can have them. <laughs> uh, and um, then we have our operational items, um, which is your typical office budget things. Uh, and um, we have added a new line at, under our operational items though. And this is the GA hardship assistance program. Um, we think that this is a really valuable use of uh, your money and a nice way to get money back in your pockets if you should need it. Um, and Javier, do you mind talking a little bit about this program? Sure. Um, if you give me a second, I'll try and share. Uh, I can. I think I have it open. Okay. Do you have Stephen's nice version or my ugly version? Yeah. So Stephen, can you share the proposed proposal? Wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, so um, I didn't know that unions did this kind of thing um, and I had to be educated on it a little bit. Um, before I start, I have to thank uh, Bobby, uh, Glenn, Stephen, and the rest of the e-board for kind of helping me put this together. Um, so essentially a hardship assistance program is designed uh, to offer some money to GAs who fall upon hard times, uh, be it financial, um, economic hardship, or something we've had to call the loss of consortium hardship. I'll explain that in a second. Um, this is kind of a starter program. Uh, this is probably not the final version. We'll see this is our test version and we want to try it out for spring 2021. Essentially, um, we're asking that members approve an allotment of uh, $1,600 um, from the budget uh, to this program to allow a committee um, to uh, issue three hardship assistance awards based on specific criteria to GAs who might need them. Um, this process is intended to be very um, very regimented so we can honor our fiduciary duty to your money um, and we wanted to share you know publicly what we have in mind for the structure um, and eligibility criteria um, so that you can feel confident in what we're doing um, other unions do this kind of work they, they offer these kinds of programs um, i think that this is something relatively rare for a graduate assistant uh, union to do um, but especially during these times uh, which seems so uncertain i think it's a very good idea to, to push this and i'm asking you to really consider moving it. Um, essentially, this would authorize the executive board to form a hardship assistance review committee. They can, uh, they will review applications up to three per year. Again, this is also to change. This is just kind of to kick us off with this program. Um, based on specific criteria we'll discuss in a second, they can award anywhere between, I think, $100 to $500 to be distributed as a Visa gift card um, so that you can use it uh, for, you know, if, if you're falling up on a a financial hardship used for groceries or something, or if your car broke down, you can use it to, to pay a mechanic or something. Um, mm -hmm. For medical hardship, you could potentially use this to pay off some of, the, some of your medical debt. Um, and uh, Stephen, can you sc start scrolling down? The the committee, thank you, Stephen. The committee, uh, just all the way down. The, the committee would have to report uh, any uh, awardings to, to the executive board. Um, the committee has a duty to avoid appearances of impropriety. So if your friend is applying and you're on the committee, um, you may have to take a step back and uh, the e-board would appoint, or specifically, I think that one of the co-presidents would appoint someone to fill that gap again so that we can do this on a, on a needs basis as opposed to a, a nepotist basis. Um, this will be a kind of needs driven. Um, you must, be, to, to apply for, for the hardship assistance, uh, you must be a, an in-unit member for at least a semester, a dues paying member for, for at least a semester. 
um, and you must not be within four weeks of graduation. Um, this can take some time. We, you know, we, we're, we might not legally be able to give you money if you've already graduated um, and are no longer a member of the unit. But there's three essential criteria. Um, you can apply for the uh, award if you're undergoing a medical hardship, a financial hardship, or loss of consortium. Uh, you would be asked to provide documentation to support your claim. Um, we're not just going to issue money um, without any kind of evidence. Um, for medical hardship, this may include receipts or, or, or bills. Um, you know, uh, we we would promise to not really publicize this information at all. Um, we can add, we can definitely add that language in here, um, but this stuff is would be kept confidential. It doesn't behoove us to publish it either. We could get in really big trouble. So rest assured that that won't happen. Um, financial hardship, um, sometimes for, with especially immigrant students in mind, uh, delay in, in updating your immigrant status can, can really be costly and affect your ability to, to work. Um, so we had this in mind for them um, or anyone, you know, we don't get paid much. So um, once something like a broken car happens or some kind of damage to, to a home or property comes along, uh, it can be very, very uh, costly. So um, we wanna have a, a safety net for you in the union. And lastly, loss of consortium. Uh, sometimes we're dependent on others uh, for our livelihood, um, be it a family member, a friend, or a partner that, that you live with. Um, something, sometimes terrible things happen to them, unfortunately, um, and your ability to support yourself is jeopardized as a result. Uh, the loss of consortium means that medical or financial hardships don't have necessarily happen to you directly. They can happen to those that you depend on, and you can still, have, um, you can still uh, get that hardship assistance. Um, we would require anyone seeking this assistance to sign a fraud statement um, so that we have recourse in case they lie to get money from, from, from you um, that they don't really deserve. Um, so keep this in mind, we're doing what we can as a union in charge of your money to protect your interests. Um, and that's pr pretty much first and foremost in, in our minds as drafters of this program. But I wanted to share that and I guess give anyone an opportunity to ask questions. Um, this document, I think, will be made available through our website, maybe, um, once we kind of finalize it. Um, but this is, like I said, a preliminary kind of uh, step in this direction. We want to have put this into effect in spring 2021. We may have to make some changes um, based on how things go. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll open the floor if you have any questions about what we're proposing here. OK, I'm, yeah, I'm not getting any hits. Yeah, any, uh, you guys can raise your hands in the participant section if you have any questions about this. All right, I'm not, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, so that's what we're You're asking. Like person, I'm sorry? You're like the best salesperson. Oh, geez. Um, I, I make no commission for this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think it's something that many of us have wanted to do for some time. Um, I admit that I was a little hesitant at first, um, and then I got educated, and now I'm really trying to push this through as soon as possible, um, along with question. other people. I'm sorry? We do have a question from Federico. Yes, Federico. Uh, hey, guys. I think this is a great idea. I love it. Um, do you do we, did you do like any calculation thinking whether this is going to be enough of a, a pool to get started? And do you have any idea how you're going to adjudicate the, the funds if you have more applications than the money that we have? So that's a great question, Federico. We wanted to start kind of small, but we do reserve the right to make changes to the structure uh, of, this, of, of this program relatively quickly if we wanted to. I, I wanted to kind of give us the liberty, um, assuming that you know um, whoever's on the committee will, will have the, the specific criteria under the program writing, um, you would have to offer proof of whatever you're asserting, right? So for instance, I think that the hardship committee would, as, as they have a fiduciary duty to not award you $500 if you're seeking coverage for $300 in medical expenses and you offer only proof of that, right? Understanding that some costs are not going to be refined to just a bill or receipt, but you need to offer evidence. This needs to be an evidence-based uh, designation by the committee. Um, and I think the mechanism to assure that is that they have to report any kind of assignment or, or assistance award to the e-board. Um, so there are multiple layers of this um, and it needs to be evidence and needs-based kind of designation, uh, the way that it's written. Um, we're starting off with $1,500. Uh, I think that all of us envision expanding that. 
um, at some point, but we wanted to start kind of small. We rather start small and then expand rather than uh, start a lot, a lot of money out of the budget to this um, and then kind of scale it back. Um, we also, you know, we I think it's easier for us to pass a smaller resolution than just a bigger one as a matter of procedure. Um, so that's kind of where our heads are at on those issues. I don't know if that answers your questions, Federico. That, that sounds like it answers most of them, except for what we, what we would do if we had a, a surge or flood of, of applications. And I think if, in, in that situation, um, you know, one of three things or maybe all three or two, three things could happen. One, um, the amount of the awards don't necessarily have to cover the entire amount that was applied for. So if somebody needed, say, $200 for, for a medical bill, um, you know, it's possible to say, look, we can only award you 100. Two, um, we, we could, because this is, the spirit of this is meant to be means tested, we, 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 we would look at, you know, how much the person's making and if you have, because there are some GAs who make, you know, into the 30s, 40s, thousands of dollars, you know, maybe if we, in the event that we have a flood um, of applications, maybe we have to say, okay, look, we, we have people who write their minimum stipend, taking home $16,000 a year, we have to prioritize them. Three, or lastly, um, you guys are tough, really tough people, and you don't reach out to us whenever you can. Um, you know, I, I don't expect people, I, I trust the members, um, I don't expect people to reach out unless they, they really need it, right? In which case we want to help them. And so far we have not had a mechanism for doing so. And you know, that's something that's, that's bugged us for, for a long time. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, I think this, this is kind of a pilot for us. Um, I, did, I, did, I, did, I think that when we drafted it, we did want to give some liberty to both the committee and the e-board to create more opportunities for assistance, but we need to see a need first before we before we ask you to commit so much of our budget to something like this. And it's, a good, and it's a good question, by the way. Yeah, that was no that's a really good question. We also have a question from Monica in the chat. Um, she says, would this be based on a specific application period or a rolling basis? And she says, overall, it's a great idea. She thinks it's a great idea. Thank you, Monica. Um, I guess I haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> um, I think we would have to devise an application first. Um, and I think that um, I imagine that just theoretically, we'd want to do this on a rolling basis. Um, because, you know, I think it's kind of silly to, to limit your ability to apply for a hardship. You can only let your hardships happen within a certain period of time. That's just not the way that these things work. Yeah, you know, that'd be um, absurd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to wait to crash your car until March before you can get, you know, before you can ask the union for money. I, I think that um, I think that a rolling basis is appropriate. That's something that we probably want to put in there. Um, but we would we would I think that we it would be prudent of us to put an application to make an application that includes a fraud statement, maybe make some minor changes to this language. Um, I think today we're asking for the for you to prove the allotment of money. Um, in 1600 for a possibility of up to three five hundred dollar awards and i think a hundred dollars necessary for um getting the visa gift cards and stuff like that yeah processing fees we can't just ask yeah, so, ask for these to show up <laughs> you yeah, know we, we, we skipped something here sorry you know um when we talked about this we were originally discussing how we should distribute the money it's not we aren't able to, to cut checks essentially that's going to be a big no-no um but we didn't want to limit people to say Publix or Amazon. Um, nobody should shop at Amazon anyway. Stop using Amazon or eBay or whatever. Um, we thought it would be best to give the, the person experiencing the hardship the respect and freedom to use the money as they see fit. Um, so really, Visa gift cards are the only option. The only drawback with those is it, you do have to pay a fee for the card itself, unlike other gift cards. So the extra hundred dollars are is in there to cover um, the processing charges and stuff. So thanks for the question, Monica. Yeah, I think the intention is for a rolling basis, and uh, we will have an we'll have an application process soon once we can allot the money. Um, R, I see you got your hand raised. I did get a question on the chat first. Oh yeah, go ahead, uh, go ahead. So so then I'll jump back to you. Um, 
and then we'll get UFI. Um, so Kimberly asked, how, how does this mesh with other programs the university has? So this is totally independent. This is something that we're doing as a union um, and something that we're allowed to do regardless of anything like food and fork pantry um, or uh, I know that the OGDI office will kind of do things to help out students who are experiencing like uh, homelessness or, or, or transitional periods in their, in their, in their life. Um, we wanted to offer something that um, was not uh, was not ex exclusively available through your employer, um, something that was available through your union. Um, so I don't think that this would prevent you from necessarily seeking those other options. I do know that a lot of them are also kind of funded by us anyway through the fees that we pay or the tuition that's paid on our behalf or um, like food and fork pantry is very donation dependent. Um, so we wanted to offer something um, that you, you know might be a little quicker to deal with, um, a little bit um, more intimate and responsive to the situations of employees um, that was not really employer dependent. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I promise to go to Ara, um, and then I, I see some other questions as well in the chat. I will jump into them. Uh, I do think these are our very excellent questions, <laughs> and I'm glad that we can kind of talk about this as a group. This is really getting the wheels turn, uh, turning. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Ara. Yeah, so um, I know the original plan was um, like three awards of $1,500 and no flexibility on that, or, or 500 rather. Um, uh, and so did we did we end up going with the you know the awards from 100 to 500 and however however like however many of those will add up to 1500 so i think right now we're at just three awards total anywhere co costing us from 300 to 1500 but we still have that money in the fund so we could hypothetically if we don't spend all that money it would be very easy for the e-board to inject money into that um, and create another, or not inject money, but use money that's left over to create a fourth award or even a fifth award. Um, okay. We do have a general body meeting in March, I, or usually in March or April for the spring. We're forced to have one every, uh, I think, fall, spring semester. So that would be another opportunity for us to revisit the program. And if we want to expand it, kind of inject it. But for these next three, uh, four, three or four months, uh, we figured this was a decent amount to start at. Um, it would give the committee and the e-board wiggle room to create additional awards if there's money left over in the account. Right. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, we can talk about this later, but I just think, you know, in general, moving forward, you know, it's, it's a very specific hardship type of hardship that we're targeting because you yes. know, we can't pay like a huge medical bill. So it's something more in the, on the order of like, Oh, I, I'm out of money this month and my car is in the shop. And I think the more flexible the amount, the more, you know, actually actual good we could do, but. I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I think that um, where- but, but the range is important too, because you know we have um, you know people who are on such small stipends, but you're right, we do need the flexibility to have a large award, and that's why we can have up to 500 for a medical bill send, but then somebody who's on the minimum stipend on 0.25, right? They're making $8,000 a year. Being able to help out with just 100 is gonna go a long way. So, you know, for people who make such small amounts of money, um, you know, ha maybe they're caught up with their rent, they're caught up with all their bills, um, and they were able to buy stuff, then all of a sudden they got like a flat tire, right? And now they can't get to school. Well, I mean, if they're making $8,000 a year, you know, that's something that the committee, you know, I would hope would say is, is worthy of the assistance. And, you know, a small amount goes a long way in those cases, if that makes sense. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I personally wouldn't be opposed to the idea of expanding that number. I do think as a fiduciary, people with a fiduciary duty with this money, we we should be able to justify it. And I think that we will in time. Uh, but for now, we're just asking for this small amount to see how things go. If we get flooded with applications, we can say, look, <laughs> we, we were only able to give three awards of $500 um, and there were 80 plus applications. You know, I think that there's 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 big you know there's huge problems with with our <laughs> with our employee employer relationship if we're getting 80 of these applications, but things happen beyond both of our controls as employer and employee, right? Um, as fiduciaries, I think that we um, this is a good place to start, and we're very open. At least I am to even having an emergency like member meeting to to throw more money into the fund. Um, this is just us taking our little. 
was not ashamed and, and of I, our, our yeah. little can of Coke and smashing it into the wall and saying, off she goes and sending her off to sea. Um, yeah, and I will say, I mean, there's a good chance we're gonna have to have an emergency meeting early next semester anyway, so there will be an opportunity definitely um, if we have a surge of applications to, to expand it. So, I mean, essentially what we're asking is like, will you allow us to, to start this program with this very narrow floor and ceiling, right? I mean, it's a very conservative, careful um, pilot program. I mean, because it was, it was Javi and I who were duking it out over, over this in the first place. Um, so this is, this is the product of that. I think it's a, a damn good product. Um, and I really want to thank Javi for, for drafting it. I'm a details guy, um, and I, th I think that you know some of the some of the issues I expect are not necessarily about you know what we're doing internally, but more so like you know um, we we have rules we have to abide by with your money that are state rules, and um, we want to make sure that we on our end have that well understood before we start committing you know a, a lot of money to this that we know what we're doing before we start asking you to allocate that much of our budget into this program. Um, that's part of our conservative thinking on on, on this end. Um, we want to make sure that we can ensure a smooth transition before we ask for a larger commitment from the from the membership. Um, I, I think uh, Fee had a question, um, and then Nicole. Um, is there any way to divert funds for socials, which cannot happen during the pandemic to COVID response, including this fund? Uh, sure. Um, that's uh, I, well. I'm probably not the person who can answer that, <laughs> honestly, Fee. Um, I know that uh, like we get budgets and um, I think bargaining spent very little this this year. Also, we normally spend on printing materials on more events, um, but I, I think that that money gets washed anyways into our surplus. Um, so I, th I think that there probably is a procedural way. Um, I think whether the, we it's the e-board e discretionary budget. That's why several general body meetings ago, we created the e-board discretionary budget line to avoid any appearance of impropriety. So we have a big chunk of money that's basically at the e-board's discretion to, to put into the other line items as need, as need be. So if something is taking up more money than, than we thought, and it's popular with the members, we have this other pot of money to take from and inject into it. Um, that's if, if Stephen, if you can go back to the, uh, to the budget, because I just realized I'm talking about something and there's no visual cue. Um, so yeah, just just above the GA hardship assistance program, you have the um, executive board discretionary budget. For example, funds like that um, could be used to offset sudden um, a sudden deplenishment of of other line items, which has been done in the past. And, and I, right, I, I didn't think that that's, that's true, Bobby. We have in the past voted as an e-board to, I think specifically with bargaining, where we didn't use up all of our funds to put them into other things. Um, and we didn't need, we don't think our, our constitution requires that we go through the, the membership to do that. Um, so I think that also answers Nicole's question, if it's possible to allocate more money towards the hardship fund. We could use it, we can do it through that mechanism. Um, we could also call like a quick member membership meeting um, to, to pass that we we're a structured organization we can't just take money and move it around and, and that I would I would argue that that's a that's good as someone who pays money into this organization you know I, I want things to kind of be stringent and transparent to some extent um if the, we well, with the exception of like we do ask the members to approve of like this forty five hundred dollars in, in flex money for, for situations like that right right so we have that pool to use kind of liberally um I, I think that we, if we, if we very quickly, I don't want to speak for the entire e-board here, but if we see this surging demand for this kind of assistance, it's probably a good incentive for us to reconsider um, how much money we want to put into it um, and what kind of action we want to take to get that money in there as soon as possible. Um, So Fee says, uh, we could talk about when to schedule a time to check in, renew and replenish the hardship funds since there's every reason to expect the funds to be carefully managed and every reason to expect the crisis to continue. Um, so I would say, my, my suggestion is let's approve the first thing that we need to do. 
Um, we won't, so there may be some bumps on the road, um, again, procedurally, legally, I don't think there will be. I think that, oh, my connection isn't stable. I apologize. Um, I don't think there will be, but before I think that we can in good faith ask our members to commit more money to this fund, and I'm totally open to that, um, <laughs> we want to be able to tell you that it's working out, right? That we've had this many number of applications, that um, we, we, we allocated our flex money into this. This is very, you know, we have ways of dealing with uh, a, an unexpected demand initially. Um, I think we're willing to meet uh, membership uh, or have the spontaneous membership meetings to, to kind of funnel this. Um, I'm open to setting a date, but I, I will leave that up to um, either the rest of the e-board or this committee once it's created. Yeah, well, I, and I, I'll, I'll, yeah, that's actually a really good point. So the committee can always go to the e-board and ask for um, either another membership meeting to discuss expanding the program more broadly with a massive injection of funds or um, inject, injection of funds from the e-board discretionary budget. That being said, for a separate reason, I think there's about a 75% chance we're going to have another, we're going to have an emergency general body meeting in January. Um, so for all intents and purposes, we will be meeting in January and this could be brought up on the agenda at that time. Um, we're gonna be meeting in January probably to discuss a work action that we're gonna be speaking about very shortly. Um, and this can definitely be, be discussed there. Um, yeah. All right, um, any other questions in general about the budget? There was one post by by Emily. Um, oh, okay. If, uh, so people might be discouraged. There's only three awards available. Uh, I guess my my counter to that, and just to be clear, I'm the person proposing the initial form of this, not the final form. Um, not uh, you know, I expect there to be changes in the future. But um, if we don't get, if you know, there's going to be a lot less good faith reason for us to ask you to put more money in this award if three people don't apply at least <laughs> you know we have to be in a position where more people are asking than we have to offer awards for for us to ask you to put money into it or else we could run into trouble as the people who take care of your money right that's kind of where i'm coming from so i i we, if if people don't apply um and there's a need then, then we're not really going to expand the, yeah. the number of awards, you know? Um, yeah, we are and, in a position and, and to- this. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I will say this. I, I don't want to schedule too many meetings because I want people to actually show up. But if we don't have an emergency meeting in January about a work action, then we can definitely have one about just this, right? I just don't want to schedule like two different ones because I want people to actually show up, right? So- I'm more than okay with having a general body meeting um, to discuss how this program is going. And by way of that, like, you know, the, the state of our, of our general body um, in this crisis in January, if uh, as a separate meeting, if we don't have a, a, a meeting about a work action um, that during which we can also discuss this, if that makes sense, right? So either way we can ensure that a meeting is held in January. Sounds good. Yes, we'll definitely, this is just to start. Um, I'm, lo I'm loving the energy. I'm loving how supportive people are about this. And yeah, it's great. Already wanting to explain that's good. <laughs> and yeah, talk about messaging, making sure we get the, the idea out there. We will definitely, we look forward to your input, but also we'll definitely be considering this as we promote this program. Um, all right. So if there are no questions about the budget in general, I think that we could take a vote can, on. Can, um, I will say that I, I think that it's more than reasonable to, um, when, if this passes, which it seems like it might, um, I think it's more than reasonable to, to let people know um, if funds run out, there are um, ways to, to, to get more funding and it, to answer um, who, I think that was to answer Emily's question. Yes, I think that's reasonable, and I think that we can we can definitely uh, make that be known when we uh, if we if we pass this and announce it, we can 
we can definitely include that information. That's a good point. Okay, are we ready to vote on the budget? Well, can you maybe outline the voting procedure uh, quickly? Uh, it'll be by poll this time, right? right? But I mean, like, uh, is it majority or? Oh, yes. Um, majority, yes. Ma this is, yeah, this is majority. Okay. So, okay, we'll go ahead and vote on this budget. If there are no other questions, I don't see anything in the chat. And no hands raised. Okay, Stephen, can you put up the poll, please? Are we voting on half, or have voting on the? Are we voting on the hardship first, or voting on the budget first? Oh, let's vote on the hardship first. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Okay, I guess I should give people like what 30 seconds. Is it timed on your end? I've never used a poll in Zoom before. I've never, I've voted in polls, but I've never made one. It is timed. Okay, good. Yeah, and just, just so you know, Meredith, um, after we vote on this, after we vote on the budget, before moving on to organizing, Alyssa did make it. Yeah, um, I see her. Yeah. Hope the meeting went well, by the way, fingers crossed. Oh, wow. Um, wow, this is great. <laughs> and then we'll see you all in January. Yeah. Okay, so this hardship proposal has passed unanimously. Um, that's great. We can really push this forward and help members who, who really need it. Um, I know we all probably can relate to, to this hardship in some, some way. Um, okay, next let's vote on the budget. Are there any questions about the budget? I know I've asked already, but I just want to be sure. Or any comments, any discussion? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see any hands raised. So let's go ahead and start the poll for the budget. Awesome. Another unanimous um, passing of the budget. Great. So our budget, our 2021-2022 20, uh, budget has now passed. Yay. Thank you, everybody. Um, unanimous, unanimously passed. Awesome. All right. Thank you. That item of business is done. Uh, next, we have Alyssa here, our chief steward, who's going to talk a little bit about um, um, work that you can do in your department. Okay, hey guys, um, if you are on GAU stewards list, I've already sent you this in an email. If you're not, uh, we could still use uh, your 
participation. So essentially what we've found out is that there's not a lot of departments that have heard from their graduate students. And in particular, there aren't any grad coordinators outside of the English department that have heard from their graduate students about uh, their opposition to the planned face-to-face -face reopening. So I have a draft letter that can be sent to your uh, grad coordinator if you would like to. And if you'd like that email, you can go ahead and just email me about it. I'll send it to you. I'll go ahead and post uh, my email where you can reach me off of UF email in the chat. Um, but essentially what we'd like people to do is to send a message to their graduate coordinator just saying that you are opposed to the face-to-face -face reopening, you don't think it serves your interests, and um, you believe it's unsafe, or something to that nature, detailing your opinion about the opening. And ideally, if graduate coordinators have um, heard from their graduate students about the fact that they that their students don't believe the face-to-face -face reopening is in their best interest, then um, when graduate coordinators meet with deans, that is something that will get reported. Um, so again, what we found is that when uh, I know from speaking to the English department graduate coordinator that when she has raised concerns, she was told that no other graduate coordinator from any other department has heard anything from their students about um, being opposed to the reopening. So if we want to fight this, it's important to let our graduate coordinators know what we think and what we feel about this reopening. So that might include maybe getting a hold of your graduate student organization and having them email the graduate coordinator on your behalf. That also might look like individual graduate students just simply sending an email to graduate coordinators. Um, again, my emails in the chat, please email me if you have any questions or if you would like a draft of my uh, personal draft statement to graduate coordinators. Um, again, it's, it's kind of just kind of, it's going over basic information like I'm opposed to the reopening because it's reckless, unsafe, and it's not serving my best interest. Essentially, it says that, but you can definitely feel free to use my wording. Alyssa, do you mind if I share, share the copy of your draft letter in the chat, the one that, that was sent to Bobby? Do you have it? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, go ahead and share it. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and please, and it's, and it's preferable that you, you get other people in your department to sign it as well and send it as a group. Um, so, you know, our, we always have more authority um, when we're acting as a group and not individuals. Please also, um, you know, take the lead. If somebody in your department, um, let's say by tomorrow or early next week, isn't reaching out about this, um, if you could take the lead in gathering signatures, um, putting them on the letter, and then emailing the letter to your department heads um, while CCing us, um, that'd be very helpful so we can keep track of um, who's also in this letter, because as of right now, as Alyssa said, um, the administration is of the view that there's only one department that, that cares about this. Um, and that's you know, not a good place to be. So it's important to get this on the radar of, of every department that we can. And it's important that we get as many signatures within that department on each letter that we can. Um, yep. This is something that can be done um, over the next week, right? Simply gather signatures, um, not that difficult. Um, send a letter to your department heads, CCing us. Um, it's also gonna be a good warm up to something we, uh, a work action we might do, um, hopefully next semester, if, if UF doesn't start turning things around in the past. Yeah, and keep in mind, this goes directly under that like march on the boss idea. Uh, where we collectively get people involved in our departments and take this letter to the boss, our graduate coordinators, or department heads, um, to let them know we have an issue with this, and a lot of people have an issue with it. So, um, and that way, especially if you're if you're doing it in a group signatures, you're you're not standing alone on 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 this. Um, there is a question from Esteban. Yes. Hi. Um, just to be clear, so you already have a draft of the text. And um, the main idea 
the better outcome would be if uh, this um, the signatures are sent through uh, the either the graduate student association or in a big group, right? If if the graduate student organization um, is on board, is not, which is sometimes difficult, yeah. If it's not overly bureaucratic and clicky, it would always help to get their signature on it and send it to them. Absolutely. However, it is, there is nothing wrong with just collecting signatures over, and this is you know um, yep. what I would probably do, yep. collecting signatures over the week and sending it yourself. Yep. Um, um, you know, you, if you get half of your department's graduate workers to sign on to this, um, that's a that's, that's a, a serious it's a serious statement. Yeah, and you will be taken seriously. Um, you know, I think speed is important, right? We need to to start making pressure on the university about reopening, as well as yeah. about racial justice, um, affordable housing, um, and uh, austerity more generally. Um, we need to start escalating quickly um you know this letter is a good a good start yeah um, so I, you know I, I think it'd be good um that's you know my ask of every one of you here you know um get out to your departments um especially if you're a steward and get these signatures collected and sent by the end of next week um if you can do it through the graduate student organization your department if they work quickly and are not overly bureaucratic don't want to you know wordsmith it and you know argue over semicolons then you know of course it's great to add the the support of of those organizations but if 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 they're going to be um obstructive i would i would recommend just circumventing them yeah and um the other thing is i mean this is technical but perhaps we and let me know if you prefer just an email ab about this but is there any format through which it's better to do this, uh, I guess. Well, I mean, it could be a Google form, right? But we can discuss that. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, either way, I mean, the most important thing is is the signatures. The two, yeah. most, important, the two most important things are the signatures and letting us know um, yeah. that, the, that the thing has been set. Yeah, just a final um, comment on that. Um, uh, this is getting addressed in the chat, but I wanted to reiterate it for everyone. When you do uh, let us know how this went in your department, CC organizing at ufgau.org, but also CC me as well. So that's two people, just because I wanna be able to uh, have all that information to present later, um, since I'm gonna be the point person on this. So sorry, you have to CC two. Awesome. No, 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 absolutely. This is great, yeah. Um, we also have a question from for from Bryn in the chat. Sorry, Bryn, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Pronounced it perfectly. You're like one of five people on the planet who do that. So congrats. I can uh, sound out words. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so hi, my name's Bryn. I'm new. Um, so uh, I'm, I apologize if you all have already had this conversation at past meetings and you're like, oh, God, she doesn't know. But um, I, so just just in, in general with the with the, the reopening problem. Um, I mean, of course, I'm completely against reopening and I, I very much appreciate the efforts of, of, of our union to um, definitely, uh, you know, suing uh, UF against, um, you know, ADA violations and protecting the students who have, who are at most at risk um, from, um, from the possibility of, of catching COVID. Um, so I'm completely on board with everything, but from my un, from what I understood about this, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, the the issue was that UF um, the issue is more with the the state legislature rather than than the university itself because I thought uh, Florida was threatening to take away uh, UF's funding if it didn't reopen. So I just want to make sure that our our messaging is clear here because i think it would be a little strange if you know we have all these bargaining sessions and we're like please don't fall off us please don't fall off us um and then but then we're also like but also don't open the school and then uf loses money and then other employees get for loft so is that i'm just i mean maybe i have no. you all have the information or something you no. are 
Absolutely right, Bryn, in that um, UF, I mean, this idea is coming from higher up than UF. However, it is it affects all of the universities in the state and UF is the one that is like, other universities are not responding in this way. They're still allowing like students to teach or to be in um, virtual classes. UF is, is responding particularly aggressively towards this. And so we, by putting pressure on them, we hope that they can, they'll back off because I mean, if other universities are not, I guess, shaking in their boots because of DeSantis, <laughs> um, UF really has no reason to either. And to, to address um, the funding issue, as much as UF claims that they are broke and they need to furlough everybody, they, they have an endowment that they can tap into. They have a rainy day fund that they are ignoring at our expense. So this is us trying to put that in their minds. We, we are, um, we're, we're promoting things like cut from the top. They don't need to furlough us. They can, Kent Fox can take a Friday off once a week. And, you know, um, so th that is our idea is that if that, if it needs to come down to that, we are not the people that should be as deeply affected by it. There are other options that UF is not addressing because they, they like their bonuses and their large paychecks. Yeah, and you know, so graduate assistants have already been exempted from, from furloughs. We've already won that, that battle. Um, but also they can- sure, but I don't wanna screw over other workers, you know, exactly. like, I mean, it's great that we're exempt, but I don't want, you know, the custodians to lose that their job. Absolutely. So the next thing I was going to say is, um, you know, that that battle's already won. Um, that being said, we are still, we we are we don't want to see any cuts to any faculty or staff, including support staff facilities. But we are being presented with a false choice here. Um, the university can withstand a, a a budget cut from the state. Can, can withstand a decrease in appropriations for a year, can even withstand some loss of tuition revenue, um, perfectly fine. Um, there is, the endowment is, is, is so large, and while it is true that some, now if you go and look this up right now, after we get off this meeting, you'll see that there are a lot of restricted funds in the endowment. Um, so I just wanna prepare everyone for, for that talking point because the university will bring it up a lot, you will, notice that word restricted floating around a lot. In reality, there are two types of restrictions. There are true restrictions, which are the restrictions that are placed on donations made by individuals or organizations where they say, you know, this money can only be used for scholarships. Then there are nebulous or fake restrictions that the board of trustees places on endowment funds. So the board of trustees might say, we are setting aside this money in the endowment for the artificial intelligence uh, program, right? Kent Fox's baby, which by the way, they're telling us all to prepare for cuts, yet my Facebook feed is loaded with advertisements asking to donate to this AI initiative of Kent Fox's, right? They're spending money on that, fine. They won't, won't touch his baby. Um, that money can, the restrictions on that money can easily be lifted by the BOP. There, it's, it's, a, it's a false choice. They, they have the money. Um, it's, you know, it's, I, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from, Bren, um, but it is a, um, particularly sinister lie that university administrations like to, to push out there, right? They, they like to, to cry, uh, poverty when they, unlike many other public institutions like fire departments, um, social services agencies, K-12 schools, they don't have this extra set of money, over a billion dollars, to to cover stuff like this, right? There are there are plate there are institutions, um, like I said, social services, K twelve schools. They don't have this type of flexibility. The university does. This is about the university um, essentially being greedy, right? They want to save the endowment. They don't they don't want to they don't want to sacrifice anything, even though we've all had to sacrifice through this whole pandemic. They don't want to sacrifice their AI initiative. They don't want to sacrifice their buildings, right? They don't want to sacrifice any of their plans. They want to be completely insulated from this. So they like to say that we are at the mercy of the state legislature, but they're not. And that's okay. just something that we're not, you know, we're, we're not 
I, I would urge us not to accept. Um, okay, yeah, all, and, all that makes sense. So, so yeah. cool. All right, thank it you. Is, it, and, and, and I do want to say one more thing. Um, they made a similar argument back during the Great Recession about cuts. Now, they didn't say like, oh, if we reopen, if you guys expose yourself to COVID, everything will be fine. There will be no cuts. But they did cry poor mouth and through a similar campaign launched by um, somebody who's actually now our service unit director, or not service unit director, he's, he's one of our uh, service unit directors, uh, Graham Picklesheimer. Um, he had a campaign during the Great Recession and they were able to stave off any serious uh, cuts, right? So we, we've been through this before. Um, and, I, and I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, and it's just sad, cause like, you know, nobody likes to talk about endowments, it's, it's, it's boring stuff. But it's important. Um, you know, the universities are very unique in that they are both public institutions and private institutions, right? As a state entity, we are part of the state university system, we are a state institution. But we have all these arms like the Shands Hospital, UF Health, like the Florida Foundation or University of Florida Foundation, the athletics boosters. Um, we have all these um, entities that are actually organized as federal nonprofits, so technically they're private. So they like to, you know, claim public service poverty when it benefits them, but they're more than happy to take advantage of their private nonprofit status when they can get a fancy initiative like self-driving buses that nobody wants to ride down Second Avenue. Um, regarding that, I had a couple of questions. Um, I was thinking the last week I was thinking on this and I didn't find it, but is there a clear document that gives rules on how the endowment can be used? Because because um, I, I know that endowments, yes, it's true that um, whoever donates can put some rules. And in those rules, there may be some wording uh, pointing out to the, the, the duty to use the endowment in such an occasion as this one. Perhaps there, are, there is some rule on, uh, to our advantage. Um, I, I do doubt that there is taxpayer money going to the endowment, but if that well, were the case, it's not taxpayer money, that's the thing. And, but most of the restrictions, the, 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 largest, the, the largest pot of restricted funds are these restrictions that are placed by the DOT and can easily be removed by the DOT. Most of the restrictions are not the true restrictions that donors place. Yeah, but what about, what about in terms of restrictions, what about in terms of duty to use it? Is, it, is there some playbook through which we could scavenge there and see if some donation or some part of it says you gotta use it if there is a global pandemic if there is a major disaster oh that, that you yeah, have the other way around the whole strategy but on the other side yeah that nothing was found so um there was an audit of of the university's finances that the faculty union paid for the audit didn't uncover anything like that the audit did uncover though was that essentially, even if the university's worst case scenario were to play out, um, you know, the, the worst case scenario for enrollment of undergraduates, which is a you know, major source of revenue, and the worst case scenario for state budget cuts, the university's endowment could absorb um, any of those blows for about two, two years, I think it was. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, um, nothing like that has was uncovered during the last audit, which was done like a month or two ago. Um, but I mean, if I could get a, if we could get the playbook, if there is some kind of um, document that draws the specifics of what, when you can use the endowment, when you have to use the endowment, and when you shouldn't use the endowment, perhaps we could find something. Is there some kind of name for that document? Because yeah. It would be, there would be a series of documents. Okay. It would be any of the policies of the UF Foundation, the University of Florida Foundation, any of their policies. So the, the corpus of policies which are listed on that, on the UF Foundation's website um, yeah. would, would, 
that's where you would that's where you would look. Unfortunately, UF is very very sneaky. Um, <laughs> if you compare the like the word count in UF's documents, policy documents, yeah. um, including the UF Foundation, to say that of USF and FSU, it is they are UF's is ridiculously small. They are very vague. They give themselves a lot of wiggle room. Um, so good luck trying to make sense of it. It's yeah. not you know that's, I I prefer reading FSU's honestly because it's nice clear. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a real policy, right? Whereas UF's is like, yeah. mm, you know, send us something. We may or may not take it seriously. We don't know. Um, it's really bad. Um, yeah. But, you know, they they have the money, and it's our job to, to pressure them to um, get their spending priorities straight. Yeah, and you can yeah. you can go to UF Foundation, University of Florida Foundation's website to look at all these policies. Yeah, um, yeah. And I I'm confident that that you'll probably reach the same conclusion. Um, Pressure campaigns have been effective in the past, and we hope that they will continue to be effective, which is where we will talk to Ara, who will give us a bargain or an organizing update, and maybe some insight on how we can fight this. You're up, Ara. Oh, hello. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you all for, for coming to this meeting and thank you for joining the union. Uh, my name's Ara, uh, I'm the organizing chair. Uh, we've had some great events this semester. We had a picketing of a football game. Earlier in the semester, we had a protest outside of uh, Fox's mansion in conjunction with the faculty union and other local organizations like the DSA. Uh, and that went really well. It actually made the national news, which was really cool. Um, and actually, this coming Saturday, so two days from now, we're planning a, uh, a, a car caravan at the last home football game. So we're just, we're going to get in our cars. We're going to drive a pre-planned uh, route. We're going to, you know, honk our horns, wave signs, you know, get a lot of attention. Um, so, you know, obviously we'd love to, we'd love to have you uh, at that. Um, and if you can't make that, um, there will certainly be more events uh, next semester uh, in conjunction with our efforts, which I think we'll talk about later. Um, but yeah, I, I really encourage you to attend these events if your personal health situation um, allows you to do so. Obviously, they're, um, they're socially distanced. Uh, they're as much as possible, the uh, masks are required. So I just think it's a great way to, to get in touch with other graduate students. And, um, you know, also I think, you know, we all kind of live in the abstract nowadays. So it's 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 good to be reminded that, you know, that the, the fight is real and, and concrete and that there's other people fighting for the same thing that you are. So uh, that's my pitch, uh, if you, have any ideas for like a direct action or if you want to get more involved with um, GAU organizing, I'll put my email uh, in the chat and obviously feel free to contact me. Um, but yeah, that's uh, about it. Yeah, keep, keep your eyes posted on social media for um, details about the upcoming car protest. This is a great way to get people out that, are, that can't make it to picketing because they, they are sensible and want to stay inside. We really encourage you to to join us. Um, if you have any uh, uh, faculty, if you know faculty that would be interested in joining this, we would love to have them there too. Uh, we just kind of want to make some noise before a football. Yeah, game. exactly right. Um, wait, Meredith, did you want me to like introduce the uh, the planned work action in my little up little segment or? Um, we can, I think Bobby is going to talk about that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if we can pull up, um, Stephen, can you pull up the resolution on the work for election? Okay. So I want to take a moment to read that while I, while I talk. Um, so as Meredith mentioned, and as Ara just mentioned, 
Um, our anti-austerity campaign has been very active. Um, we have picketed, we have, we have written letters, we have worked with other community organizations to pressure the university to um, get its priorities straight, in essence. Um, you might have seen our, our anti-austerity flyer that um, has a pretty lengthy list of demands, um, none of which have been addressed yet. So we need to start ratcheting up the pressure and escalating what we are, what we are doing. Um, we've had some success, like I said, with the furloughs, um, but they haven't addressed racial injustice. They haven't um, meaningfully addressed furloughs and layoffs for other employees who aren't graduate assistants, right? Bren is 100% correct. We cannot see janitors laid off either. Um, they have continually taken advantage of this crisis while everyone is fo focused on COVID-19, which is a serious issue, um, but while everyone's distracted by that, they have pushed ahead with plans that they had previously reversed, such as demolishing the McGuire Village and University Village South gra graduate housing complexes. These are affordable options um, that disproportionately benefit international students who need that disproportional benefit. Um, they're doing, they're demolishing this housing in the midst of an affordable housing crisis in Gainesville, Alachua County. You know, they're only going to exacerbate it by just destroying that important stock, right? It doesn't just affect people who live in those graduate villages, but now, for example, um, with people no longer being able to access those affordable units, there will be more people in the market for, say, a continuum. A continuum can increase their already obscene rents, right? So it affects all of us. Um, and as you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of emails about letters going out about how safe it is to, to reopen campus because most of the transmission is, is happening off campus, which by the way, it's happening by UF students. Um, I guess we're supposed to be happy that they're spreading it to our neighbors and not us on campus, which is ridiculous. But regardless, these things need to be addressed. They've taken us seriously. And some issues they're not taking us seriously in others, so it's time to ratchet up pressure, um, which means we need to pretty soon do more than just protest. We need to actually inflict some pain on the university. Um, this is going to require a lot of all of us. I want to preface this by saying that we cannot do anything until we get buy-in and more members. We have departments where our density is way too low. Um, if we're gonna do this right, if we're going to see a meaningful addressing of our demands, we need to be larger membership wise and we need to all act in unison. Um, you know, we can't just have a couple departments doing this. That being said, um, what I'm asking for here, um, and what the executive board is asking for here, is the ability to call um, what's referred to as work to rule. Um, I'm not aware of any graduate worker union ever engaging in a work to rule action. As far as I'm uh, aware, we would be the first, but this has been done um, in the Postal Workers Union and in the K-12 Union. And typically what happens there, um, or sorry, more generally, a work to rule is where you do your work exactly how it's required to be done for exactly how long it's required to be done. And then you withhold any additional labor for the day or for the week. Um, so it's a very you know, passive aggressive uh, work action, but it's perfectly legal. In this state, we cannot strike. Um, there are legal liabilities for several of us if we were to go on strike and we cannot protect anyone who strikes. So this is the most we can do, um, but it's effective. So in K-12, <clears throat> what you would see oftentimes is um, teachers walking their students to the bus at the end of the day, but instead of going inside to do lesson planning or instead of going inside to answer parents' emails or help plan an event for the school, they all walk out, right? Their contract says they have to get there before the buses, stay there till the buses leave. 
and that's all they do. They don't respond to parents' emails at night or on the weekend. They don't have extra meetings with students, right? They do the bare minimum. And it gets the employer to notice how much extra they do. And it usually brings them to, usually brings the employer back to the bargaining table when things are, are not going um, well. It's gonna be a little different for us um, because each of us, um, depending on our departments, or each department has, um, sorry, work, the graduate, the work that graduate workers do looks different in each department, All right? Um, political science, TAs do something different than English TAs. The extra work they do is different. Um, so what this entails, what extra labor you're withholding is gonna be department dependent, right? Um, what's gonna be important is that once we've all um, agreed to not do that extra stuff or to simply stop working once we hit our hours, right? 10 hours a week on 0.25, not hard to hit. Um, we just have to agree in order for this to be effective um, to basically meet up somewhere, make it known that we are off duty for the remainder of the week, right? For an example would be, um, you know, uh, try to hit your required number of hours on a Thursday by, by Thursday every week. And then, um, you know, Thursday at 2, 3 p.m., once you, you've worked your maximum hours according to your FTE, you go pick it in front of Tiger Hall, letting them know you're off duty, right? Um, something else that I think would be good would be automatic email responders so we could all refuse to respond to student emails over the weekend and after 5 p.m. Um, and we can refuse to respond to professors' emails if it has to deal with our work assignments um, after 5 p.m. and over the weekend. That will get a lot of attention. Um, doesn't seem like much, but I promise you, uh, managers, especially those in Tiger Hall, if they get the sense that there's any sort of friction um, between students and workers, uh, they're going to take notice. Okay. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be up to each department to coordinate what they're going to do. And we will help you with that if this passes. We will help you identify what extra labor you do um, and identify how to withhold it effectively. Right? Um, but it's once again, it's going to require a lot of leadership on your part. Um, but it's, I think it's going to be effective. We want to um, basically call this, right, when we have the density, when we you know, get our membership boost a little bit and get people on board, we wanna call this work action and do it publicly and make four demands. The demands have to deal with um, reopening, right? We want them to shut it down. They have to deal with um, the, demo the demolition of McGuire Village and UVS. Um, Racial justice, uh, finally wanting to get the university to invest monetary and human resources into addressing racial justice issues on campus. This demand, how it's going to look come January or February, is going to be dependent entirely on UF Black effort and the Black Writers and Organization. So essentially, under this proposal, um, one of our four demands is essentially reserved um, for Black student organizations so we can, we can help them out. Um, and then finally, we want them to um, commit to not cutting any staff, faculty, or services. Um, and then the work action would be called off once, once those demands are addressed. Now, the likelihood that they will be addressed 100% to our liking is low. They always are. But we can still affect meaningful change if we get them addressed at all. Right now, these four issues are not being addressed at all. Um, this is something that we can do. That I think would be highly effective. Once again, it's not a strike, but I do want to note that the in their graduate work orga worker organization just this semester, they went on strike to demand a uh, closing of the campus and disarmament of police. They didn't get those two things, but they did get a lot more flexibility, a lot more people exempted from having to work on campus, and 
they got a program called the uh, University of Michigan Ambassadors Program, which was a spend, essentially a bunch of white people going around campus as like a neighborhood patrol spying on minorities, right? They got that shut down, right? So even though this isn't a strike like that, it's the closest thing we can do in Florida. And it can, I, I think, really bring the university to the table on these issues, these issues being ones that we cannot directly in collective bargaining. Um, so this is something, once again, it's gonna require people to step up, help us bring their departments together to identify what sort of labor they can withhold legally um, and all agree to buy into this plan to withhold that extra labor. It's gonna require us to get people to stop answering emails after five and on the weekends. Um, and also commit to public displays of, of the action. Um, that makes sense. So if you guys want to discuss this, um, I look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts. Yes, it would be during spring 2021. Um, the, the resolution isn't actually voting on starting this work action. It's, it's voting on whether to empower the executive committee executive board to do so um we we can't call it right now there's still some some work to do in terms of building the capacity once again in order for this to work we need not necessarily every department to do it but we we want to be able to slow down about half a campus yes so one of the asks would be shutting down campus like they did last spring right um we're not gonna unfortunately we're not gonna get them to shut down campus before they reopen it but i think that we along with the faculty union and the gainesville community and other organizations on campus can hopefully um see at least a repeat of what we had last last spring where they shut down campus after a few weeks or a few months we want to do it in a few weeks if then it was a few months um one of the one of the demands is re, is reserved specifically for um, the black student organizations, um, you know, we're not going to speak for them uh, without their consent. We have spoken with representatives from the black graduates and organization in UF Black Effort. Um, they're aware that there's, there's a slot reserved for them. So one of the demands will verbatim be written by them. Um, so the first demand would be re uh, closing campus. Second demand would be um, whatever the black graduate student organizations need come January if they can't get that town hall, for example. Um, reverse the third demand would be reversing the demolition of McGuire Village and UBS, um, and committing to not cutting any staff, faculty, or services. So yes, so that's one thing I, I did want to say. Um, uh, yeah, so Claudia, our hours are going to be used up very quickly with all these new requirements. It's going to be so easy to, to, to use up our hours. Yeah. Um, and I did want to share something with everyone. Yeah, see, that's, yeah. Um, I'm going to share something in the chat. Let me see. Sorry, my computer is very disorganized. Mm -hmm. Did, does everyone see a file that I just sent? Yep, it's there. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead and, and start practicing logging your hours and, and seeing how quickly, um, how quickly you, you, you hit them. And it's this, there's a workbook here that allows you to keep track of your hours um, and also guides your attention to things that you might have not previously thought to been part of your work, right? Um, Answering emails is definitely part of your work. When you are sitting and thinking about, you know, how to best, and I'm in political science, I'm trying to think how best to explain the 14th Amendment and incorporation of the Bill of Rights to the states. Um, you know, it might not seem like work when you're not really making that power, when you're not directly making that PowerPoint, but you know, you're sort of thinking about it, you're in the shower, um, and all of a sudden you have a light bulb moment, aha moment, um, 
where you're like, oh, wait, that's how I, that's how I explain this. That's how I get this idea across, right? That's a good five, 10 minutes of work. Log it, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff we do that, that we're not aware um, is labor in this, this workbook hopefully will, will help draw people's attention to that stuff. Um, those damn cognito trainings, for example, take way too much time. Um, office hours, um, having to contact technical support for Canvas, stuff like this. It easily takes me an hour to make copies for my classroom. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. most of us are going to be teaching more than one, one section now because we have smaller classes. Um, I teach a, a lab, an, a, an upper level graduate course lab, and I have to clean, I will, I will probably have to clean microscopes in between classes um, or be expected to do that. And that stuff adds up really quickly. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so count everything, practice doing this, right? Um, And I, I think you'd be surprised with the results and get your, get your colleagues to practice doing this, right? There's, and, and, and practice doing this before any work action is called, before the work to rule is called, practice doing this, right? This is, I think, a good way to, to get people prepared. Um, and, and I think it will also allow people to start thinking about where they can cut back, right? For example, maybe it's the case that in your department, um, you know, there's gonna be some departments where we have faculty support. And if this is approved, I'm going to go to the faculty union and try to get them to do something similar. And ideally, we can match up departments where both the, the faculty and the graduate workers are wanting to do this. In those cases, there's a lot that we can withhold without fear of retribution, right? Um, there's going to be some cases, though, where uh, the IFAS, for example, IFAS isn't unionized. Uh, sorry, the IFAS faculty isn't unionized, the graduate workers are. Um, in, in, in IFIS, it might be the case that the faculty don't want to assist you in this um, and they want to, to oppose you and obstruct you from exercising your right to not work more than you're paid for, um, believe it or not. But it could be the case that um, instead of something like really big, you just have to cut back on the comments that you leave on papers, right? Grade less thoroughly. I mean, just say, look, I'm doing everything that you're asking me to do. I can't do it to your high quality standards because you're not paying me enough, right? I'm only getting paid for 13.3 hours. Um, so I, I, I would like everyone to, to take this work, both practice with it yourselves, get your um, department colleagues to copies of this as well, um, get them to practice and you know, be ready for, for when we can call work action and, you know, goes without saying. If there are colleagues of yours that aren't union members, get them to sign up. Um, in order for this to be effective, in order to make this work, um, we need a lot of people involved. Yeah. And I did want to say something to uh, respond to Bren. I, I had that same reaction um, about campus shutting down mid-semester and then undergraduates who, who are then stuck paying rent that they don't need to pay. Um, I had spoken with the professor in my department about it, and she had reminded me that there is still an option for any undergraduate, any undergraduate who wants to take classes remotely to do so. And many of the students that she's speaking with are planning to take it remotely. Right, so um, we have a situation where the undergraduates are given a choice and we are not. We undergrads have the option to do online only? Yeah. What the hell? God damn yeah, it. they do. And actually many of them must because the high flex modality only allows for 10 students in class. So they will. Yeah, the, the, the people who, for, for the most case, you know, for the most part, I'm not going to say 100%, but for the most part, the undergraduates that are coming back and renting apartments in January are going to be those of means that we don't, don't have much to worry about, right? Those affluent Miami kids and some of the cars they drive around have seen it in Gainesville, I'm sure. 
And I think that's primarily what we're dealing with here on campus. Yeah. Um, also, note that this book, you need to make a new copy every week because you want to you be able to save these logs and there's a different tab for every day. And there's little directions here. So does anyone have any questions about this action, comments, concerns? I need to put it to a vote. Let's vote. Let's vote. And if you have friends in Georgia, tell them to vote too. It's very important. <laughs> yes. Um, by the way, this is if this passes, um, when I was referring to um, a 75% chance of needing another meeting in January, this is what I was referring to. Specific, specifics going over this, assuming it passes. Wow, awesome. I was not expecting that. I'm very happy with it. <laughs> All right, start Great. talking to people in your departments, please. Get members to sign up. Start thinking about the extra stuff that you do um, that you wouldn't have to do. I will be in contact with the faculty, um, the faculty, sorry, the faculty union specifically, um, and trying to get them on board as well. This is loving this result. Um, Emily, if you would like, I can get you a list of people in your department to email. I can get you email lists um, if you just let me know your department. Um, and I actually am going to put my email in here. I actually meant I'm in English, so I. Oh, okay. My department's kind of. I was. I meant like, um, can GAU use that email list from the petition that went around that has a bunch of grad students who are who agree with this cause, who maybe aren't all already in GAU, are I, I, allowed to use that? Yeah, I'm really sorry. There are a lot of issues going around. Can you be a little <laughs> more specific? Because I, I need to make sure that we know the people who, who authored the petition, right? Because there's, we couldn't. Is this that petition yeah. from the history department? No, um, let me try and find it and I will get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, so, like, any, anything that would help is would be great, right? For example, the letters that we're asking you to, to gather signatures on and send to your departments, we want them to succeed. We'll also be able to look at, you know, who signed those letters. And those are people we know to talk to about this, about this work action. Um, so I, 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 I like the idea, Emily. I just, I just don't know the uh, specific petition you're talking about because there are so many petitions. Um, I'm currently making petition to end petitions, for example or limit them to, to one a week <laughs> that sounds really counterproductive to your mission sorry it was a, it was a bad joke <laughs> let me try to quickly edit it to one a week i hope you're not waiting on me because it's going to be a minute you're okay um okay. yeah so if you need to get information from me uh, about like email lists for people in your department, I can get that to you, um, both of like members, current members and people who are not yet members, um, email me my or, or email the organizing account. Um, I've already got a couple of requests that I will follow up on. Um, yeah, that's a good quick way to get in contact with people. And yeah, really try to normalize this keeping track of your hours right away. And, and so it's part of your routine and I know things get lost within the second week of the semester, but 
This is kind of like a, a work up work action. Yep, that's the one I mean. Okay. Yeah, we actually can, we can contact people from this. <laughs> Look at all those people. <clears throat> if it's available to us, we can we can sort it and get uh, emails sent out to anybody who's on there. So if you are also on that list, you may hear you may hear more of this information again. <laughs> I thought that might be useful because it has the departments that people are in. So you can sort by grad student and then departments that are especially weekly represented. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anything else we need to cover? No, uh, so there's open floor. So this is a chance for anybody to um, speak up, ask yeah. questions, make announcements that they would like. So just to kind of, to maybe get out in front of something. So like the, the particulars of this, the logistics will be discussed probably at the next meeting. Maybe at, an, at, a, at a next meeting. A later meeting. Yeah. yeah, probably not to call in January, but in the meantime, we need to normalize people tracking their hours. Yep. And we need to uh, get the stewards to, we need to get this information to the stewards um, and have them distribute this um, time log to normalize it um, in departments where departments that aren't represented here in this meeting. Um, but also department people, uh, stewards and their departments um, need to start thinking about the extra stuff that they do that they can withhold once this action is called. Yeah, uh, uh, and can I just can I just maybe say something really quick? Um, you know, I just, you know, personally this, I know this feels scary, like it feels scary to me and maybe it feels like, um, you know, you're being unfair to your undergrads and you're like screwing them over or whatever. But, but I just think you don't have to frame it that way I think that like, you know, personally, I plan on, on sort of being direct with my undergrads um, uh, and sort of saying like, you know, this, this semester is fucked up, you know, it's, it's just all this bureaucratic bullshit we have to deal with. Um, you know, so we're going to kind of take it easy this semester, you know, you might get your grades a little late, but don't worry about your grades. You know, they're not going to be too bad. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to screw you over. Um, so I think maybe that's sort of a good way to go about it. Cause really what we're doing is like fighting against the bureaucratic inhumanity of capitalism. And I think that's done through uh, communication and uh, community building. But anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Undergrads are our natural allies. Sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Ara. Yeah, this is, I, I, I love teaching. I, I'm really excited to get back into the classroom. I hate that I have to teach face to face though. Um, it's like a kind of a bittersweet thing, but they, they'll, they understand in, in the long run. Um, I, I imagine many of them that are in classes don't, well, I don't know. That, I, can't, I can't make those sweeping statements. <laughs> um, yeah. I had something I should have mentioned earlier. I apologize. Um, but the contract for bargaining will be up for a ratification vote um, before the end of the year. It, I, I encourage you to vote. Um, and I encourage you as a bargaining chair to approve uh, this contract. A lot of people spend a lot of time working on it. Um, it sets us up nicely, I think, for the future and really puts to rest a, a, a giant monster that um, in healthcare that uh, has been picking, looking to pick a fight with us for about three years. I think we've really resolved that in a very uh, favorable way. Um, so look out for ratification notifications um, in the near future, probably before the new year. We'll be looking to implement it before 2021 so that these changes take effect by then. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or the other members of the bargaining committee directly. 
Um, it's our job to make sure you understand what you're agreeing to, um, but look out for continued bargaining notifications to that effect. Yeah, thank, thank you, Javi. Um, and we have we have filed a another, sorry, that's a little inside baseball. Technically, we're supposed to either be doing these ratifications by mail or by in-person voting. Um, last time we did an electronic vote online, we were able to do so by filing a petition for a variance to, the, to those requirements. That petition has been filed um, to do it again for, for, this, for this contract. Um, and I'm expect I might have already done it today, but I'm expecting um, a copy of that petition um, either today or tomorrow. We can, um, if I get that, we can we can essentially hold the ratification vote on the 22nd um, while the while the variance is pending, unless any of our members um, complain about the voting procedure. So if any of them demand a mail ballot. Um, for in-person voting, we, then we have to wait for the whole case to work itself out. But I don't expect that to happen. Um, we don't have any members of the Trump family in our on our membership roles, so I don't think we're we're going to have Giuliani coming in here uh, throwing his fits about the voting procedure. Bryn, what do you mean by KN? Maybe oh, I'm out of no, your KN95 mask. Um, oh, but, yeah. No, not that I, I haven't been to my office in like a month. So who knows what's in there? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious how they're planning on, on distributing them. Cause I know that they said that everyone who is teaching in person is, is getting one, but I have not seen them distributed yet. Um, on that note, if you do not receive one, um, or you would like a different mask. Um, I there. It, this is kind of this is this is like a little under the radar. I'm like, but like, um, <laughs> um, but uh, there there are there's a place on campus where you can you can get fitted for a mask. Uh, no questions asked. So um, I'm gonna drop my email here, and you can email me, and I will I will take you to this this sacred cool. location chance um you can get yourself a mask good yeah one thing that i have been thinking um i don't know it's really hard to understand people when they're speaking through a mask yeah so i am going to be dedicating some extra time which i will be logging as hours to like practicing my articulation <laughs> and doing the best i can can i mean and this is stuff that, that is helping me be an, a better teacher in the conditions that we are being forced in and that's going to eat up time in my that i'm being paid for but <laughs> i i was taught how most of my geology from a man who spoke through a large beard and i couldn't understand a damn word he said so um i can only imagine what it's going to be like for masks for all of our students I don't know about anything about captioners. I honestly, I don't even know if UF thinks about that stuff, UF admin. They, th that's a great question though. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't, but uh, that's just something I noticed some of my students uh, complained about was if internet connection ever cut out at all, they lost that information. But I was thinking about for students with ADD and ADHD and then students with degrees of hearing loss, whether or not they know that, having a mask on is yeah. going to greatly like kneecap their capacity to even understand what's being said. Yep. I worry about that significantly. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. Black market masks. Yep. <laughs> Thank you everybody for being here. This really, um, this is the, I think one of the best attended general body meetings I've ever been part of. There is like, some silver lining to this awful world we live in right now, even though it's, I, I would, I would go back to less attendance at meetings if we could be in person for sure, but it's nice to have everybody here and it's good to see all of your passion and your strong involvement. And I really um, encourage you to keep this up through the next semester. We are really going to need your support. We're going to need your help. And, and we're gonna need you to be little organizers and helping us get new members. 
So um, keep keep your eyes on on um, social media posts. That's our best way of contacting people, and through emails. Um, and please share any any um, suggestions, ideas you have. We we greatly we want to hear from you. You're our you're our voice for for other graduate students. So we really rely on you. And if there's no other things to talk about, I would say that we can wrap this up. All right, um, meeting adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a great Thursday night. Really productive stuff. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. <laughs>